I I'm trying to, what supports did I see as helpful during French? I remember getting that um, everyone, I would have everyone also be listening to their audio on a tape and I would have always my French teacher read um, my French audio to me. Um, my hearing loss wasn't as severe then. So I think if I was in school now, I would need some more support now than I needed then. Um, I remember in university accessing the disability support office and uh, using that for a year, but then not really anymore after that. Um, I didn't find, you know, I, they had a note taker that would take notes in class, but I found my own notes were more thorough. And then what if, if the two note takers um, notes contradicted each other, I didn't know who's to follow. So I ended up just using my own notes and discontinuing that support. Um, knowing what I know now, what additional supports would I, I have liked to have seen? Um, I think probably something that I do try to do more now that I didn't necessarily have then was the social aspect. Um, I wasn't, didn't really ever have a super close best friend peer that I confided everything in. Um, and I know my mom was more that person for me. Um, sorry, of the background noise. Um, I remember as an adult hearing of a lady that for her child, she scared flashlights in her car so that when it was dark and they had friends in the car, her daughter could lip read her friends. Um, and I thought that was a pretty cool idea. Um, so yeah, I think socially is probably where I would have benefited more. Um, as a professional in the field, what accommodations would I like to see? I wish there was a default contact uh, email contact listed for everyone for parents and all that sort of stuff um, because a lot of times if someone has an accent or something like that I can't understand and then sometimes I think the phone conversation went well and it apparently didn't so then I clearly mis misheard um, I yeah I wish that more of the continuing ed things had closed captioning sometimes even the AXAPA and SAC, the colleges, they don't have captioning on things. And then I think, oh, I want to participate in that. And then I realized by the end of it that I haven't really caught much of it. So I'm not really sure if it was worth it to participate. Um, I think, sorry, I'm going down, I'm reading off what I wrote before. Uh, what can consultants do to improve our service? Um, I think my for myself is uh, self-advocacy so um, even I know personally this is still something I'm working on that I need to be talking more to schools and parents about email being easier for me um, using my own DM system more all that sort of stuff um, so yeah I think just realizing that that's something that even as an adult uh, people with hearing loss struggle with that that it's still something that we need to continually work with the students on um, and that I need to work more with the students on. Maybe other people are doing it more than me um, about why, what is their motivation for not using it? But they, is it because they don't want to inconvenience someone or how it'll affect them socially, things like that. Um, another part is technology. So I'm somebody who gave up my FM pretty early in my school career and uh, it isn't until this year that I started using it again and realize how much easier, easier it is when I use it. For example, I'm listening, using a Roger to this uh, webcast right now. And then I think another part is the sort of family piece of it that I know we are um, contracted through school, but that um, I was lucky I had a lot of family support who helped me with, um, you know, things. But even knowing that there were things like, um, it's easier for me to hear if I'm towards the front of the vehicle. My seat in the van was always in the back of the vehicle because I was one of the older kids. So I, that's just where I had to sit. But, you know, if my family had known if I sat in the front where I could lip read everyone better, they probably would have allowed for that. And I just think of things like that, that, you know, I was talking to a uh, parent of a child who had unilateral hearing loss and his good ear was not, was towards the window and, um, Yeah, so they want to provide more support for families that outside of school, what can they be doing to help their child? 
Um, I think that's it for me. I was trying not to go over time. <laughs> It did start a little bit late, and my apologize, apologies for that. We're going to be hearing from um, Melanie Monahan now. Melanie uh, is working in Eastern Edge RCSD, so she has a large geographic area. And we're going to switch places here as, um, as gracefully as we can. So. <laughs> Hi, I, I'm Melanie. So you have to excuse me. I have a cold. So I'm going to do my best to speak loudly. <laughs> and Carly, feel free to reaffirm me if I'm not clear. So I'll start now. Um, I, I wear a cochlear implant in my left ear, okay, cochlear and nucleus band. And I use um, the voucher Phonak. DM technology. I'm using the voucher slot right now. Question two. In, in elementary school, I had a full-time educational assistant. And I, I know my parents had to advocate for all of the supports that, that I received. But my educational assistant, she knew sign to sign English, and she acted as a part-time interpreter and she also supported me in, in the class. I was pulled at least once a day for one-on-one -on -one work in junior and high school. My educational assistant provided occasional in-class support and out-of-class support, one period a day. At this time, I had a couple of revision cochlear implant surgeries. So I spent a lot of high school not hearing very well. In high school, we experimented with note-taking, where my, my educational assistant would type notes on a laptop, and I would read them on a second laptop in real time. I, I enjoyed this because it gave me more independence. I, I didn't have to sit right beside her in class. In terms of an FM system, I had a sound field system in elementary school, and then various personal systems in junior high school. I particularly remember carrying a speaker and putting it on my desk in junior high. I hated this, and I would not do it. So the school installed a permanent speaker on my desk. And I hear that even more. <laughs> so it, when the more discreet ear level FM systems came out, I, I didn't know I want to use it. And I was, I put it away. <laughs> and I, I never used it again until grad school. I, I also wish that I had been told about it when I was at McEwen because the technology was so much better and smaller. As for other accommodations, I always have preferential seating, extra time for exams in a quiet location, closed captioning. Now at the time, not that everything was captioned. So my educational assistant quite often would take the movies home and just do a transcript herself. And my EA, she also took notes from you when I was in class. And I received speech and language services throughout elementary school. So in terms of support that I saw as helpful, I was part of a cochlear implant group at the Glen Rose in, in about junior high school. At the time, I was one of a few children in Alberta who had an implant and families traveled from all over the province to come to these meetings. It was wonderful being able to relate to others who had the same experiences and challenges as I did. I was also encouraged to tell my teachers about my hearing loss. 
I had the opportunity to meet them and tour the school before the start of the school year. I felt so much better knowing my teacher was familiar with me and hopefully my technology before I even set foot in, in the classroom. However, I found the best support was in university. In um, particular, I had real-time captioning. And to be honest, I was probably only hearing half of what I was hearing all through kindergarten to high school on a good day. So my, my grades went from high 60s, low 70s, to 80s and 90s. And I think it was finally because I was getting the same information as everyone else. In university, I also occasionally used tutors and tried note takers. But like Amber, I found my own notes were better. I also had extra time for exams in a private location. So knowing what I know now, I, I wish I had more educational audiology and consultant for the deaf and hard of hearing supports. I think because I was in a smaller community, I didn't get, get as, as many visits. I think I would have benefited from technology and social support and also advocating for myself. I think that the skill shops we put on are, are especially great and I would have benefited from that. And I, I also wish that, that we would see him captioning in, in the classrooms, mainstream classrooms, and not just in university. I know that is very expensive though. And I'm just happy to see that it's being explored in the States. So as a professional in the field, I would like to see the following accommodations As they're always saying, my, my district is really large. So we, we do quite a bit of online conferencing. And I find that challenging sometimes because it, even when I use the voucher system, it's, it's always dependent on the audio on the other side. So sometimes there's interference or their microphone is not good. And that makes it very difficult for me to hear. And I, I also wish that email was more widely used because there's still times when I would email someone and it takes forever for them to respond or they don't respond. So sometimes I'll text parents, which is fine. And I, I also try to ask for captioning at webinars and conferences. I remember attending a conference in grad school and they asked myself and another deaf student to share a captioning. So we had to attend the same lectures. The other student also preferred using an interpreter. So it didn't work for her as well. More recently, I asked for captioning at the Speech and Audiology Canada conference and was initially told no. After I expressed my concerns that they did not have this accommodation, they did provide captioning, and that was wonderful. And the final question, what three things are critical learnings or skills to become a, a successful person who has deaf or hard of hearing? So number one from you, was it self advocacy? This was not something that I developed until well into university. I think this was because I had full-time support all through school. And I, I always had someone who would just kind of step in and solve the problem. So uh, if the FM was dead, she, she would take it from the teacher and charge it. So uh, when I went to university, it was daunting to have to do this myself. The second one is technology use. I wish I had more support 
and using my technology. Knowing Prasad, my mom and educational assistant could really explain to me why it was important. And I didn't always want to listen to them. I also wish I had known about the supports available to me in university. Specifically, the world of technology that came out in undergrad and that I, I could purchase a laptop under my grant. I don't expect my higher school or university to know this. So this is where deaf and hard of hearing supports can come in. And the final one is family support. Like Amber, I was very lucky to have a supportive family. But outside of school, not a lot was done to accommodate my hearing loss. Not because they didn't want to, but they just didn't know. Yeah, they, so I, I found large family events to be very challenging. And I was very happy to see an article on hearing above me, specifically about accommodating your deaf and hard of hearing child at large family events. And that's something that I try to share with my clients. So that's it for me. Thank you, Melanie. Um, that's great. And Melanie writes down ha ha behind all of her comments that are funny, but you don't know that there is a ha ha there. <laughs> um, I'm going to introduce Nancy Galhart now. Nancy's a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing with Edmonton Public Schools, and um, she'll give you some information about her supports as well. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Nancy, and uh, one of the questions asked of us is to briefly describe our hearing levels and technology. Um, I have no residual hearing in my right ear. And my left ear, um, the hearing has changed over the years. Um, initially, uh, sort of moderate, severe, with some high frequencies. Now I have no high frequencies at all. Um, I wore a bicross for many years, um, but now I just wear one hearing aid on my, on my left ear. In terms of educational support, I guess I'm probably the oldest of all of the speakers here. So um, my educational supports uh, kind of predate <laughs> some technology. Um, I had a, but in terms of the primary support, my mother was a big advocate and she was in the schools uh, constantly um, to make sure that uh, my needs were being met. Um, in, in the elementary years, I had a woman who, she worked in the role of an SLP. I don't know if she was an SLP. I don't think she was ever formally trained, but that was, uh, that was her role. And she came, I think she came every week when I was younger, and then it grew to two weeks. By the time I was in junior high school, um, there was another student in the school that I was at, but two years younger, and I didn't associate with boys at that time. Um, so she eventually, by the time I got to the end of junior high school, um, she was in the school and I went to see her on my own during my own recess times because I'd sort of graduated from the speech things that, uh, that um, she was required to do with me. So um, in secondary school, uh, that lady retired and when I went into high school, uh, my guidance counselor was the go-to and I really think it's important that students know who um, who their go-to person is, that if they are struggling, uh, because we as professionals aren't in there um, as regularly as we would like to be, um, it's important that they have a trusted adult that they can go and speak with, whoever that is in the school. Probably might be their family and the family advocate, advocates, but um, it's nice if there's someone in the school that they can uh, talk to as well. In um, just talking about secondary school, someone else mentioned French. Um, I took French all through my high school years. 
Um, I didn't enjoy French, and um, the listening comprehension portion of my um, assessment criteria was waived. So I think I was uh, evaluated on everything else but listening comprehension. And back in those days, they had cassette tapes that they put in the recorder and they played, and I just looked at the ceiling and waited for that portion of the class to be finished. Um, in university, um, FMs were just starting to be used and becoming very popular back then. Um, the hearing technology that I had did not support uh, working or uh, using an FM system. Um, so my biggest thing was strategic seating, and um, that's how I coped as I went to university. Um, one thing that I did find in university is that once you had um, a place where you often sat, that became your seat. So it became a strategy of mine that anywhere I went, I tried to arrive a little bit early so that I would uh, get the seat that was best for me. In terms of the support that were most helpful, I would say parents and the itinerant support that I had from the SLP, um, because she became my ad advocate and my sounding board that uh, back then when we had blackboards and uh, green boards or whatever they were, the chalkboards, um, teachers wrote and talked at the same time. Today, uh, a lot less so with uh, the technology that we have now. Um, and something maybe I'll mention now since we're sort of on that subject. Um, one of the things that I find is a pet peeve when I go into schools is the document cameras. In many ways, the technology today is fabulous. Um, document cameras are my new pet peeve. Um, quite often, um, it's located in a different area in the room, and the smart board is over there, and the teacher, I was in one room, <laughs> I was in one room, and I was looking at the teacher's back while she was manipulating things on the document camera. And so um, my, caution, my advice to you as professionals is to just pay attention to where those document cameras are, and I think the technology is changing teaching styles in that um, teachers are, especially as you get into the higher grades, are more prone to stay at their desk and manipulate what's happening on the screen from their desk. And the desk is not usually beside the smart board. Um, so the next question is, uh, knowing what I know now, uh, what additional supports would I have liked to see for learning for testing, for social, et cetera. So I'm going to switch. So extra support that I would have liked to have seen. I would have liked to have access to signing or to sign language. I learned sign language when I was in brownies, um, but I didn't use it on a regular basis. So it would have been nice to have more deaf and hard of hearing people um, to socialize with um, and to have peers. So that's one thing I wished I would have had. I also wish I would have had closed captions. And again, today we see technology uh, far advanced than what it was in my time. I don't watch TV without captioning. Um, in today's day. Um, some movies um, I watch, they must have uh, whatever it is, the subtitles or the real-time captioning. As a professional in this field, what would I like to see for accommodations in terms of my work? I'd like more use with FaceTime, Skype, uh, for phone calls because I can't often hear what's on the phone. So I do struggle with that portion. Today we're seeing more and more uh, families who are coming to Canada from other countries with strong accents and so conversations on the phone I find very, very difficult. If I can see the person face to face I may have a better chance of understanding what it is that they're saying. I think I'm very, very fortunate in my line of work that I do have a designated interpreter so I feel very fortunate. Not everybody is accommodated in that way. 
And it always comes down to the cost, right? It's always about money. So the cost of interpreters then uh, lend to frustrations for students and also for me as a, as a professional. In looking at how we can improve our services, I think right now we tend to work a lot with the schools and the teachers, but I, I believe we need to improve our relationships if we're only seeing kids three times a year, I don't know that we could say that those are relationships that have been developed. So I think we need more frequent time with the students that we're working with. We'd like more contact with the students, but also with their families. The opportunity to meet the parents um, and have them have an opportunity to see the successes that there are as role models for deaf and hard of hearing people. I think that's very important. It would also be nice to have a stronger relationship with our colleagues that work with RCSD. I know some people are very distant in rural areas. It would certainly be nice to have more gatherings and more time together as a team. For me, three pieces that I think are critical would be literacy skills, self-advocacy skills, and identity, self-identity, and then how to develop relationships or to have relationships. Those pieces I think are critical. If a student has strong literacy skills in math and English and whatnot, they will excel in their school, in their, in their schooling and be successful. If they can advocate for the things that they need, that's a, an essential piece of their education. And if they develop strong relationships uh, because they're only one person, maybe the only person in the school that is deaf and hard of hearing, it's important they have that one friend, somebody that they can go to. And also for social supports and family supports. And I'm trying to think about other things, but I think that's, that's pretty much it. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today with you. Okay, I think that's where the microphone's placed, correct? Okay. As I'm listening to Nancy, I thought maybe I should have asked all the mothers of these people to come speak about all the supports that they have advocated to have in place for, for the, um, these peers of mine. <laughs> well, that would be interesting, yes. <laughs> um, the next person who's going to speak is um, Rianne Pernitsky, and Rianne is an educational audiologist as well, and she is speaking uh, she is working with Edmonton Public Schools as an educational audiologist, and um, I'm going to sign it over to you, Rianne. Okay, thank you. Was that really loud? Okay, um, so I guess starting off with describing my hearing level, I have a moderately severe hearing loss, sloping to uh, severe to profound in both ears. My left ear has better discrim. Um, I have noticed over the years my ability to discriminate speech in the right ear is decreasing. I was diagnosed at the age of three and my hearing has progressed slowly over the years. I use um, hearing aids and um, different, many different kinds of uh, DM systems. I have the touch, the mini mic, tabletop. I kind of use whatever I have around me. I like playing around with the different systems. Um, so what educational supports did I receive in my education? Um, I had very little support looking back at it now. Um, I did have some. I always had preferential seating in the classes, which meant I was sitting right up at the front. Um, it was helpful, but wasn't helpful to see my peers behind me. I had lots of speech therapy in the school, uh, only until grade two, I believe. 
And I did work with the school librarian who was the teacher aide. Um, she, I worked with her up till grade three. And I believe I worked with her every other day on reading, spelling, some phonetics, um, making sure I understood what was shared in my classes, mostly reviewing information. That was really helpful. That was only until grade three. And she was also the person who would be checking my equipment and would let my parents know if it wasn't working. So she was also the technology person. Um, and she was the librarian. So again, she didn't really have any of the special uh, background training in speech, but she happily helped me and we had a really good relationship. And I'm very thankful I had her while I did. I think the other thing that was really good was I had a really supportive school. I felt the teachers were always really supportive of anything that I did ask and they were really encouraging. I had really good peers in my elementary. Um, I don't recall having any issues and we just, like others mentioned at the beginning of the year, I would talk to the teachers about where I needed to sit and that I had a hearing loss. And I think the biggest thing that I used in elementary was my technology. So I had my hearing aids, I had my FM system. Back then I had the lovely Y cord. <laughs> um, so it was great to see technology getting better over the years, but I was one where I had to use it. I, I couldn't hear uh, very well without it. So what supports did I see helpful? So like I said, that support from uh, Mrs. Landry, the librarian, um, she was kind of like Nancy touched on it. She was my one person that I could go to if I was having, um, if I was struggling or not understanding and needed to have that clarification and just having that time to have someone sit and talk with me. So that was really helpful. And I think it would have been helpful if it could have continued on past grade three. And the other thing that was helpful was I had another peer in my school uh, that had hearing loss. She was a grade above me. We really didn't know each other and we knew of each other, but we weren't connected in any way. But it was kind of helpful knowing that I wasn't the only one in the school who had hearing loss. That was just for elementary, uh, junior high, high school, I believe I was the only one. Uh, knowing what I know now about additional supports, what would have I like to have seen? Uh, number one, skill shops. So like Melanie said, I would have liked the opportunities to meet other people with hearing loss. And when I first learned about the skill shop, I had goosebumps. <laughs> Just thinking about uh, what a great opportunity it would have been and how good it is to, to put kids together and they can share their experiences um, and I feel like you know it, it goes back to building your self-advocacy and self-determination and I think that would have helped boost my confidence and just knowing what you could ask for and that it was okay to ask for help or ask for different things. Uh, the other thing I think would have been really helpful is extra time or exams or having time to preview and um, you know having that block in my schedule I had full schedules I had no my extra time was at home so I spent a lot of times I spent hours doing extra work in the evenings just trying to fill in things and back then I thought that's just what everybody did but now <laughs> I realize how much extra work I was doing on my own so, I mean, on the plus side, I think it did help to develop my strong work habits now, um, but it would have been nice to maybe just enjoy childhood a little bit more. So extra time, having notes ahead of time or handouts and skill shops would have been, I think, really beneficial for me. As a professional in the field, what accommodations would I like to see? Uh, like Amber and Melanie and Nancy, um, I'd have to agree with the captioning. 
is really important and, and um, using emails to communicate is easier. Um, I feel like the position that I'm in right now has been the most accommodating um, to understanding my needs and mostly because the individuals I work with understand that. I think previous workplaces, they didn't always grasp the full extent of how much I struggled at times, even though it looked like I wasn't. And I think that goes back to myself as well as being able to share to others what I need and what I can and can't hear. Um, what can consultants do to improve our service? Or I think I, I touched on what are the three things do you believe are critical learnings or skills in order to become a successful person? Uh, it's going to be that self-advocacy. Uh, you have to know, knowing what you can ask for to make it easier for you is important. And a lot of people just aren't even aware of what they can ask for or what could be helpful. So I think that is uh, an important thing and something that we need to continue working on with our kids from kindergarten up to grade 12 because it changes. And the other main thing is to be successful is if you use technology um, and it's helpful for you is using it consistently. Um, we see or I see a lot the mild and the moderate and the unilaterals hearing loss kiddos, they are not consistent users and we can just see how much they do struggle. We have our severe, profound people like myself. I can't function without my hearing aids, so I'm always wearing my hearing aids. But for those other kids where they feel like they're hearing, but they're not hearing, I, they just, I think the consistent technology would go a long way to help them. And I think uh, important thing that Nancy touched on as well, what can we do to improve our service? I think family support and education is a big thing. You know, although we work for the schools, uh, I feel that we need to work with sharing our information with the families as well. Um, I feel like if the family support or awareness isn't there, no matter how awesome that school is, it's going to fall apart at some point for that child. And so we need to have that support full circle so that they can just carry on. And, um, you know, a lot of time I think parents are, when the child is initially diagnosed, they're shared all this information and it's so overwhelming. And I think sometimes people just assume that parents know this, but they either haven't been able to retain it or they didn't understand it. And a lot of times they just think their child is, is fine or it's okay and they just don't really understand. And I think perhaps maybe we can help with explaining a little bit more and showing parents why they need to do these certain things and why we recommend and why schools are doing that. So I, I do think family support and education is also something that's really important. Um, I don't know if that can be included in our service a little bit more than it has been, but um, that was something that kind of stuck out to me as well. Uh, and like Nancy said, building those relationships with the child themselves. So, and I think that's all that I was going to share for today. Um, I will sign off. Thank you. Rianne. So the last person, and that was great. I really enjoyed your comments. Um, the last person we are having speak is Sandra Vandenhoof. And Sandra is a, an educational audiologist as well, a lot of them. <laughs> um, and she uh, works out of Calgary Board of Education. And Sandra's gonna uh, talk more about um, as an adult learner, and she'll explain the reason why she's speaking about that. So Sandra. Hi everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? Does it sound okay? Okay, great. So I have um, a, hear a severe to profound hearing loss in both ears. I have a cochlear implant in one ear and a hearing aid in the other. And I was born with normal hearing. Around preschool age, I was diagnosed with a mild hearing loss. 
And by the time I graduated from high school, I had severe to profound hearing loss. And I did not receive educational supports until university. So I went to elementary, junior high, high school um, in, in Ottawa, in Catholic school. So I'm not sure why that happened. Um, I did not know that educational audiologists or teachers of the deaf existed. So I only started to use a personal FM system um, consistently when I was in university in the um, undergraduate program uh, for communication disorders at the University of Western Ontario. And at, at, at UWO, I met um, my first friend with hearing loss, and that's Peter Stelmakovich, who works for Phonak. So he was a year ahead of me, and he taught me everything he knew. Um, so I had to catch up quickly. And I learned to advocate for myself only as an adult. So um, until then, my coping skills were a little bit dysfunctional. I bluffed my way through a lot of situations. And my grades were pretty good, as long as I could, had a textbook. But in university, when the curriculum stopped following the text, I was in big trouble. And that's when I started to investigate FM systems. So um, I'm going to focus on the last question that Sarah asked. What things do you believe are critical learnings or skills in order to become successful? And because I learned these skills as an adult, they are fresh in my mind. Uh, the first is to self-advocate, and that's obvious. But I, I think it's really important to aim high because things get watered down over time. And I have experienced perfection when it comes to a teacher using an FM transmitter effectively. And oddly enough, it, I didn't experience this in university or in the audiology program. The teacher who showed me perfection was possible was a monk in a meditation retreat. And um, he showed me that as long as someone is aware, it's possible to do everything right. And that experience had a lasting impression on me because I know what's, what's possible. And I want that for our students. So I have the courage to aim high and I think it does take courage. Um, another critical learning uh, for me was to um, drop the stories. So when I was younger, I had the experience of feeling excluded in family and in group situation. But that's not true anymore. Um, for the most part in groups, I feel included. And the technology makes it easier and easier. But one time recently in a group situation, I, the group forgot about me because of the situation. The logistics had changed. And all of a sudden, I was right back in elementary school and emotionally. Um, I didn't say anything um, in the moment because I was really upset. But then after the fact, I, I told them all and I was sobbing, bawling. <laughs> and there were 20 people in the group and they were really taken aback. And I had to explain that I was responding that way because of my history. So I, I realized that all of a sudden, all of my similar past experiences were with me and were coloring the situation. Um, and this prevented me from adapting and responding to what was going on right now. So I really learned from that situation. And I can't promise that it won't ever happen again. But I'm trying to make a conscious effort to drop the old story, things that don't apply anymore. Um, Another aspect of success is to accept help. It's awkward sometimes to be the one who's slowing things down with a pass around microphone. 
um, I noticed that this, this week when I did a peer in service with a student and we talked about using pass around microphones, the, the students who want to help besides their close friends are sometimes the students that are socially awkward. And maybe they, those students want to help because they want to be friends. And, and then also sometimes when people offer to help, they make a really big deal about it and it can feel uncomfortable too. And so my student and I had a discussion about the art of accepting help. And I, I think ideally we should accept help gracefully and gratefully, even if it's uncomfortable. And then my last learning um, is I think it's really important to have the ability to um, rally the troops. Um, so it's important for, for, to get fellow students to be part of your team. So um, there's my paper here. Um, so my personal experience with pass around microphones, it works really well when the group becomes involved, when it's part of the group culture. And so it's the group that makes it work. It's not the teacher or the student, it's the, the group that makes the effort. So when I'm in groups, I, I ask for help explicitly. And um, when I'm talking to groups on behalf of students or with students, I ask those groups for help. And when they start to respond, I thank them and I thank them often. Um, and I try and shape their behavior by telling them what helps and what I appreciate. And I tell them how much it means to me because it's hard to feel like I belong when I can't follow the discussion. And those are my learnings in a nutshell. Sandra, those are really powerful words to tell all of us and, and actually to, to end on. Um, and thank you for sharing uh, the dropping the stories piece as well as, as rallying the troops. I, it just, that's what I did when I called all five of you and asked you if you could share your story. And I really, really, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for doing so. We have a couple of minutes to ask any questions. I'm going to look over to Wayne to see one of the people in the room if there are any questions. No? Okay. And I guess the next PLC is actually at the end of November, and we have a guest speaker from Colorado, uh, and she'll be speaking on unilateral hearing loss and accommodations for those students. So thank you all for attending, and thank you again from the bottom of my heart to these people who prepared this presentation. That's it.